Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of The Yard. <clears throat> Hope you're well today. It's great that we live in a country we can celebrate Maroon Friday however we choose. Tonight at 545, we will uh, say goodbye to our graduates at Duty Noble Field as Mississippi State tries to find a way to even the series. You know, I say that n- not because I have a sense of humor, but uh, last night, Last night stunk. We're going to break all that down, but I'll be honest with you. I never thought in my entire career I would see that. You know, late in ball game, I'm starting to track down numbers. How historic is this loss? Well, second most runs allowed in school history in a game. The worst was 1943 against Alabama. And even State scored some runs in that game. It's terrible. I'm not going to sit here and try to sugarcoat it for you. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's going to be okay. It was an embarrassing loss. And the reality of it is, is I am never embarrassed to be a Mississippi State person. I'm a Mississippi State dad. I'm a Mississippi State fan. I'm a Mississippi State reporter. Mississippi State guy in every aspect of my life. But I left that ballpark last night feeling something I've never felt before. You know, I felt really bad for our kids. I felt bad for our coaches. I felt really bad for our fans. I felt a little bad for myself. It's it's a long walk to the car, man. So not that we expected to win, but goodness gracious. 27 to 2. A little busy this morning. I would have recorded the show a little bit earlier, but I needed some time to kind of wrap my mind around it. It's incredible. I'm not going to sit here and belabor the point, but uh, that can't continue. Simple as that. That cannot continue. We are Mississippi State. We don't get beat like that. It's one of those things we've said, well, you know, every once in a while, and listen, listen, I get it. You play enough, you coach enough, you have a ball game, get away from you. And I get it, too. You're trying to manage a weekend, so you, you know, you're not throwing your, your top bullpen arms. I, I get it. Now, I understand Tennessee is great and leading the nation in home runs. I get it, but we're Mississippi State. There's got to be a certain level of pride not just for yourself, not just for your scholarship, not just for your fans, not just for your family, but for the program, what you represent, the tradition that you're a part of. It's terrible. It is. And I get respect in the game. I do. But I guess maybe I thought we had a little more fight in us. Maybe I'm wrong. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I told you recently I went and had that Nashville hot chicken sandwich. It is absolutely outstanding. Got a tweet earlier today. One of our good friends and fans of the show went by and had the country fried steak burger. A couple new items on the menu there. Go by and check them out. You'll be glad you did. And now it's official. It's in writing that the spring rolls will make you better looking. That phrase was coined by yours truly. It's true. It's scientific. There are times I'll eat at spring rolls, I look in the mirror, I don't recognize myself. I look more like a dreamier version of Kip Winger. Yeah, that's right. So go check it out yourself. You'll be glad you did. Three great locations to serve your university drive here in Start Vegas. Gloucester Street there in Tupelo. And the newest one, Lake Harbor Drive, the Roads and Flowood area. Go by and check them out. You'll be glad you did. Have those spring rolls. Get the chocolate shake to go. I went the other day. I had the bread pudding before I left. I was tempted to get the chocolate shake to go. And it's good to kind of order that around the time that you're asking for the check. Maybe you're getting ready to kind of wind it down and go ahead and get it ready for you. So, like, once you pay, they hand it to you. Like, boom, you're in the car enjoying some chocolate goodness. How about that? Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, let's look at this dog of a game as much as I don't want to. Uh, we, we could just do a show of top ten list, and it might be more fun than this. But we're going to take our medicine. So Brandon Smith's on the mound. Brandon's been shaky the last couple of starts. He has been. I mean, that's just, let's just be honest about it. He has been. That When he first entered the rotation, Brandon, outstanding. And I don't know if maybe Brandon's got a little something going on. Um, but he was center cut last night. He was really having trouble keeping the ball down. And as a sinker pitcher, you would think, okay, of all of our starters, maybe he has you know, the best opportunity. Maybe his stuff matches up better with Tennessee. Well, it didn't take long for us to find out that Brandon just wasn't on his game. And, again, that's not a criticism of Brandon. That's just the reality of baseball. But the very first pitch of the game, we get some sync on one. 
get under a barrel, and he grounds out the short very first pitch. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a good start. Hey, if we get out of this thing here in the first inning, get him one, two, three, maybe we'll start cultivating a little belief in our dugout. And then uh, Lucius hits a home run on a 1-1 count. And Lucius, it seems like he's been there forever. It's because he had an older brother that played against us out there in 19. Good player himself. And now his younger brother is there, you know, part of uh, one of the greatest teams in the history of college baseball. one nothing. All right, then we have a lengthy at bat against Jordan Back, a stud in his own right. You know, again, we get ahead 0-2 here. And you're thinking, okay, we can absorb Brasillo home run here. Let's just get out of this thing. You know, next thing you know, it's a it's a one-two count, and we just can't finish him. We just can't put him away. And then he homers to left, makes it two nothing. The very next pitch, Gilbert hits a home run to right. It's three nothing. Feels like it were just throwing bad in practice. It was very reminiscent of Game One against Arkansas last year. You know, we're all jacked up, ready to go. Christian McLeod goes out there, and it's like there was this this feeling of cognitive dissonance. Like, what is happening? What 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 is happening? Then Trey Lipscomb comes up and singles through the right side. And uh, Ortega grounds into a double play. We had a couple of those last night. And uh, we kind of joked in the press box, like, goodness, if we hadn't been as good as we were defensively, we, we could have given up 30 runs. But we get out of it, it's 3-0. Even then, even though there had been this vulgar display of power, you're thinking, okay, maybe he'll settle. You know, because we had that situation at Ole Miss where Preston Johnson gave up three solo home runs in the first. We came up, we don't win the game. Granted, Ole Miss not as good as Tennessee. All right, bottom of one, we go one, two, three. Yeager flies out to left. Hancock lines out to short. Tanner flies out to right field. All balls pr- pretty well struck. You know, we're putting the ball in play. And Dollander's good. He really is. Top of second. Uh, Burke singles to center. And then lo and behold, it's another double play. This is a ground ball. Lang grabs it, steps on the back, fires to first. And we get lost in a fly out to left. And he's like, okay, again, we've held the game where it is. Maybe we got a shot. Yeah, maybe it's a long shot, but you begin, you know, three nothing is manageable, right? You think, okay, there's a lot of ball game left. We, we, we sat them down in order here. Well, at least we face the minimum here. So, you know, maybe we're in a good shot. A bottom of second, we go one, two, three. Hines flies out to center. Cumbus pops out to second. And Clark flies out to left, left center. You know, Cumbus is the only one that really didn't make solid contact here. But, uh, you know, Brad obviously is a guy that can. But, you know, you start thinking, hey, we're putting the ball in play. We're putting the ball in play. Top of third, this is when things really started getting out of hand. And they got out of hand and kept getting out of hand. And next thing you know, they're off, you know, they're off the the chain and running wild in the streets of Starkville. Stevenson's leadoff hitter singles to the left side. Still second. Then Lucia singles to left. Runners on the corners now. Back pops up to second. So you're thinking, okay, we're a ground ball away from getting out of this thing. Um. And then Gilbert you know, flies out to right. The runner tags and scores four nothing. Not the worst thing that could have happened. Two outs. We're pitch away from getting out of this thing. Lipscomb singles to the right side, sends a runner to second. Ortega then doubles down the left field line. A run scores five nothing. Burke homers to right center. Three RBIs. It's eight nothing. The game is over. Save KC Hunt. And everybody else for uh, Saturday Sunday. At that point, they had the night off. Russell then singles to left. Lawson strikes out swinging. Eight nothing midway through the third. Uh, Cam James pops up to the third baseman. Davis out, rolls one over to the first baseman, and he tosses it a pitcher that covers, and that's two pitches, two outs. Jay Gotro goes out there, has a meeting with Forsythe. We work a count. We get a walk here. Now it's our first base runner of the ball game. Turns the order over. Jaeger gets down 0-2 and then strikes out swinging on three pitches. The first K of the ball game. So, again, the first time through the order, it's like, okay, we don't have a hit, but we're putting the ball in play. And, you know, and a lot of times you, you think, okay, if we're putting the ball in play and we're getting solid contact, it's just a matter before we get going. But it's 8 nothing. All right, top of four, we pull Brandon Smith, bring in Mikey Tepper. And, again, you know, hey, there are some guys out there that are really good when the game is already decided. Mikey Tepper might be one of them. Mikey gets a 1-2-3 inning. We get a strikeout of Stevenson. Lipsius uh, rolls to first. Luke tosses it to Tepper, steps on the bag. Back then strikes out swinging. So, hey, it's a 1-2-3 inning. And, again, it's an 8 nothing ball game. I had no delusions that we may come back and win this thing at this point. But I thought, hey, maybe, maybe we've settled and at least we can get out of here with a respectable loss. Boy, was I wrong. Bottom four, Hancock lines out to right. Tanner strikes out swinging. And then Hines lines out to right field. Hines hits the ball really well. 
Top of five. Pretty crazy right here. Top of five. E e even the truest of the true maroon, their belief was crushed in this inning. Uh, Gilbert grounds out to short and Lipscomb singles to left. Ortega then pops up to short, and you start thinking, okay, Tepper, okay, hey, we're okay. One pitch away from getting out of this. Wild pitch sends Lipscomb to second. Then we walk Burke, lengthy at bat, work account full. We can't finish. Then Russell doubles to left center, run scores 9 nothing. We walk Lawson. Stevenson then singles to center field. Two RBIs scores 11 nothing. And so it's like when it went south for Tepper, it really went south. And, again, he had the good first inning of work. And here we are in the fifth, you know, pitch away from getting out of it. And the next thing you know, we've allowed three runs. Bring in Cam Teller, and then Teller gets a K swinging. So we're out of it. But, damn, listen, the ball game is over. It's just a matter of what the final score is going to be. You know, that, that's the thing you think about. And it's so hard to sit there. You know what I'm saying? It's just so hard to sit there. You know, I, it's a job for me. Some of you guys can leave. But uh, many of you stayed. And I, and I want to, you know, tip of the cap to all of those who did. Y you guys are true maroon. And, and listen, that's not an indictment on anybody else. So listen, some people say, Steve, I can't take it anymore. Listen, I get it. But for those of you that stayed, I think it speaks well for our fan base. It really does. Bottom of five, one, two, three inning for State. And here we go getting struck out in the side. It's like, you, again, you think, okay, second time through the order. Dollander actually got stronger the second time through the order. Compass K swinging. Clark strikes out swinging. James strikes out looking. Top of six. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, it does. It's a leadoff walk of Beck. Gilbert then pops up to first. Lipscomb singles to the left side. Now there's runners at first and second. Ortega with his second jack of the ball game, if a memory serves me correct. Now it's 14 0. Uh, they start pinch hitting here because the game is over. More grounds out to short. Russell doubles down the left field line. Lawson flies out to left center. We're out of the inning. We're just trying to get the game over here. You know what I'm saying? We're just trying, let's just get it final. There's no mercy rule in the SEC regular season. We're just trying to get the game over. So bottom of six, Davis strikes out swinging after a lengthy at bat. Forsyth flies out to right. Nearly nearly poked it out of there. How about that? How have that been for our first hit of the ball game? Uh, Jaeger flies out to right field. And so, again, Bulldogs hitless through six. All right, top of seven. Again, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, it does. Jack Walker pitches for the first time in a month, uh, comes in, and again, this is, you know, the game's over. Let the kid pitch, right? Let him get some experience. Uh, it didn't go the way he wanted. He did not retire a hitter here. Uh, Lupsi, uh, Scott is hit by the pitch. We get in a full count situation. We plunk the guy. Then Lupsius hits a home run. Now it's 16 nothing. Back walks, and then Gilbert doubles to right field, put runners at second, third, nobody out. Um, Lipscomb then walks to load the bases, and we bring in Cole Cheatham. And, I, and I'm a Cole Cheatham fan. I think he's going to be good. Uh, and then, you know, we're just trying to get out of this thing as best we can because it's 17-0 it's now. It's 17-0. Incredible. All right, so Cheatham gives up a single through the right side. Another run scores, charged to Walker, 18. More strikes out looking, and then Russell doubles to left center and two more run scores. So that clears the slate on Jack Walker. Lawson grounds out the second which moves the runner to third, gives you two outs in the inning. And then Scott singles, chases in another run. How about that? And then uh, they, they pinch hit for Lucius, and then we plonk Payne. And then Beck strikes out looking. Finally get out of that deal. 21 and nothing at this point. 21 and nothing, and we have not yielded a hit yet. Bottom of seven, uh, Luke Hancock works and works and works and works and works and gets a walk. Our second base runner of the game, then Logan Tanner. On a 1-0 count, lines it right back up the middle. It's our first hit, and the fans that were still remaining kind of rose to their feet. And uh, it was a very emphatic and kind of emotional response. And, again, I think it speaks a lot of our fan base. And, again, no criticism of those that left. But those that stayed, I, I thought it was a nice gesture. And, and, listen, you guys that stayed probably deserve some free Bulldog Club points. All right. Uh, then there is um, – Hunter Hines singles to the right side and uh, drives in the run, and then LT is uh, out trying to score. I would not have sent him. I know it's a 21 to nothing ball game. I wouldn't have sent him. I'd keep playing the game. And um, he was out, I thought, considerably. Uh, Compass then flies out to center field. Clark singles infield hit there, hit the ball pretty well. And then Cam walks. Now all of a sudden bases are loaded. It's like the game is already decided. 
But, man, wouldn't it be great to get a hit here? Well, we don't. Jess strikes out swinging. Stage finally on the board, and finally has a hit. Really just kind of removed uh, any possibility of further humi humiliation. If we'd been no hit and shut out, could have been even worse. A loss is a loss. Don't get me wrong. I'm no way am I trying to diminish the quality of Tennessee's win. They absolutely destroyed us. Uh, we open up. Booker walks. Uh, Sten stru strikes out looking as a, uh, as a pinch hitter here. And then Ortega hits again. That's his second one of the ball game. Makes it 23-1. to More than strikes out swinging. Taylor pinch hits for Russell. Grounds out to third. And uh, now we head to the bottom of the eighth. All right. So, you know, they're substituting liberally here. Laggett pinch hits for Forsyth and hits a tank. And uh, maybe his last at bat, I, I would say probably not. He maybe he starts on uh, senior recognition. Maybe not. But uh, Lag rips one over and really might have been <laughs> the longest home run he hit at Duty Noble Field. He hits a tank to left. Now it's 23-2. to two. Jaeger lines out to right. Hancock grounds out to second. Tanner strikes out looking. I'm thinking here maybe we can have him burn to the arm, right? <laughs> All right, top of nine. And, again, you think it can't get worse, but it does. You know, at this point, you know, we, you know we, we, we were like out of the modern day of college baseball when it came to the record book. You start looking, you know, with, oh, we lost, we gave it 22 runs to Kentucky in 2009. Well, now we're 23. Now we're in, you know, some of the biggest ever. You know, Florida State, we gave up, what, 26 against them. We got 29 Alabama and 43. It's crazy. Top of nine, Andrew Walling, Libs, takes the mound. Plunks the first guy he sees, walks the second guy he sees, and throws a wild pitch, put both guys in scoring position. We get a K swinging, and then a K swinging. Maybe we'll get out of it. You know, it's kind of been the story of Wallen. You know, he, he, he puts guys on base, and then he punches out the side. We, we walk Booker to load the bases, and then Stentra, the pinch hitter that entered the inning before, two innings ago, doubles to right center. The base is clear. It's now 26-2. And then Ortega, who absolutely has owned us, uh, takes a 2-0 pitch into right center. Makes it a 27 to 2 ball game. And then we get more to strike out swinging. Well, at this point, as terrible as it was, and it, the, the previous SEC mark for margin of defeat for Mississippi State was against LSU. We got to beat 21 to nothing one time. Well, this is now 25. This is the, the most lopsided discussion and the most lopsided decision in the history of Mississippi State baseball, SEC or non conference. Initially, I was looking at all the SEC stuff, I looked at all of it. This is the worst defeat in school history. That is a dubious distinction that you don't want to attach to your name. Bottom of nine, you know, again, we're not going to score 25 runs here. It was good to see us show a little bit of fight here. Uh, and Braywin Skinner comes up and uh, rips one down the right field line for a double. We have Aaron Downs come in and pinch hit for Cumbus. And, um, you know, Skinner goes all the way around to third. It's defensive indifference. Down strikes out looking. And here's the thing, too, about you newcomers. In a lopsided ball game like this, the zone is not the plate. The zone is basically the space between the markers of each batter's box. Anything close in a 25-run ball game is a strike. You're not look. You're not. You're not up there looking for balls and strikes. You're looking for something to hit. And so what happens is, uh, you know, down strikes out looking, and then uh, Slade Offord strikes out swinging, and then Seabird strikes out looking. So we pinch hit here, and the ball game is over. Bulldog fans, if you drive around this great country, you'll see that there is uh, still very much a shortage of quality employees. America's workforce is not back to its full capacity. Not exactly sure for all the reasons, but the uh, bottom line is some of my favorite businesses having a reduction in staff, a reduction in hours, and in some cases a reduction in services because they can't find quality applicants. Maybe you're in that situation. Let me recommend our friends at Indeed. It's I-N-D-E-E-D.com. Indeed, a hiring partner that can help you find the applicants that best fit your unique skill set. A lot of people out there having to hire people perhaps that uh, aren't the most qualified or perhaps aren't prepared for that job just to have somebody. You know, go through this screening process with Indeed by using this Instant Match program. One of the best things about that Instant Match program is you get the people that best qualify for your job. And there's some incentive for that too. Go to indeed.com slash boneyard. And because you're a boneyard listener, they're going to give you 75 bucks off. I'll give you a credit right there out of the gate. 
and you only pay for the applicants and the resumes that you use. Use it today. Get your business back to full staff and capacity at Indeed.com slash Boneyard. Have you wanted to use your home equity to pay off debt or improve your house, but found the old way too painful? There's now a new, better option for accessing your home equity. It's called HomePace. Here's the key. It's not a loan, so there's no monthly payments or interest. Instead, HomePace gives you money up front as an investment in your home. That's right. You get money that you can use however you want without the burden of monthly payments. Then someday when you decide to sell, you share a portion of the gains or losses in your home's value with HomePace. That means if your home's value drops, HomePace takes a loss too. HomePace gives homeowners a better choice to access home equity. No monthly payments, no interest. To get an instant quote, go to HomePace.com slash quote. It takes less than five minutes. That's HomePace slash quote to get started. And as bad as it was, it could have been worse. You say, Steve, how could it have been worse? Well, we didn't turn a couple double plays. It's 30. And let me just say this, too. And I mean this with all due respect to Tennessee. They are a machine. They are absolutely phenomenal. But they're not 25 runs better than us. They're not. And that's the most disappointing part of it. I I expected to lose a game. I was thinking, well, maybe we can get a game. Maybe. Maybe we get a game. I never expected to win this series, and nor should have anybody else. But to, to see this... It's disturbing. It's disappointing. It absolutely is. And I get it. You know, I mean, you 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 get the number one home run hitting team in America facing some guys that ordinarily wouldn't pitch much in the SEC, and so even though Tepper and Tuller have done, but it's kind of like you go ahead and get it out of the way, kind of get those guys done. But um, it's disappointing, man. It really is. and disappointing doesn't even sum it up. It's depressing. You know, it's like you know, as last year the highest of highs. And at this point last year, you know, we're over at Tuscaloosa uh, sweeping those guys, getting ready for a top eight national seed. And here we are again. They're not 25 runs better than us. They were last night. That's what the record book shows. My hope is we still got some juice left in the tank. You know, that's, you know if, 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 if it's me and you beat me down, you're going to have to beat me down again tomorrow because I'm going to keep coming. Of course, I don't have the the Major League Baseball draft to consider. I don't have summer baseball. You know, I know it's been a long and frustrating and challenging season, and I'm sure there's some guys, whether they want to admit it or not, they're probably ready for it to be over. And it will be, sooner rather than later. Just a despicable loss. Absolutely despicable. Let's look inside the numbers. Uh, Not a lot when you look at Mississippi State, to say the least. Uh, you know, five hits as a team. Nobody had a multi-hit game. LT, of course, one for four. Hunter Hines, one for three. Braylon Skinner, one for one. Uh, Kellum Clark, one for three. And then Tanner Leggett, one for one. Pitching numbers. Boy, you want to talk about a horror show. Brandon Smith takes a loss now three and five. Went three innings, 11 hits, eight runs. All of them earned. No walks. One strikeout. 61 pitches in just three innings. Mikey Tepper went one and two-thirds of an inning, allowed three hits, three runs. All of them earned two walks, two strikeouts, a wild pitch, uh, 40 pitches thrown for him. Cam Tuller, one and a third innings pitch, three hits, three runs, all earned, one walk, one strikeout, uh, 26 pitches for him. Jack Walker did not retire a hitter, two hits, five runs, all earned, two walks, no Ks, one wild pitch, one hit by pitch, 27 pitches thrown. Uh, Cole Cheatham, who has been good for us as of late. I know he didn't pitch well Tuesday. Uh, kind of comes into a bad situation here trying to bail out Jack Walker. And uh, you know, it took him a while to kind of tread some water and get through it. Goes two innings, uh, four hits, four runs, all earned, one walk, four Ks, one hit by pitch, 54 pitches thrown. Probably last time we see him this year. Uh, Andrew Walling, a rare appearance for him. He goes one inning, two hits, four runs, all earned, two walks, three Ks, wild pitch, hit by pitch, 34 pitches, probably the last time that you'll see him. So there you go. So now it's time to uh, pick our prime shrimp player of the game. Uh, our prime shrimp player of the game is going to be Maroon Mary and everybody else that uh, stuck out there late. Maroon Mary and I walked out of the dude together. Uh, and again, I thank so much all of you Bulldogs that stayed and cheered for our team. Uh, I know it's difficult, but you love Mississippi State. And again, not an indictment on anybody else. So save your tweets. Okay, Steve, I appreciate everybody that shows up. 
and everybody that has an M over S cap and everybody that has a shirt, and I love y'all, but this is for those that stay to the end. And in, one, in the most lopsided loss in school history, those folks are our prime shrimp players of the game. If you're looking for, for shrimp, and you should be, it's so difficult to get quality shrimp here in North Mississippi. It really is. So have some shipped up directly from a New Orleans shrimping company. That's primeshrimp.com. They'll ship it direct to your door, well-packaged, well-cooled. They can sit out in the Mississippi heat for a day. So if you're working all day and you get home from work, you don't have to panic and think, oh, my gosh, my shrimp is ruined. It's not. It's well-secured in these very handy pouches. It fit in your freezer very, very easily. And here's the deal. You get off work, take off your socks and shoes, put on a bowl of water to bowl, a bowl of water, a pot of water to bowl. Ten minutes later, you dump in those shrimp. Ten minutes after that, you're good to go. I'm very, very partial to the French Quarter Alfredo because the sauce comes with it. How about that? So you can uh, cook up some fettuccine needle, noodles and then uh, pour your French Quarter Alfredo on it, and then it's just like you're sitting there on uh, Chapatula Street. How about that? Be sure and check it out today, primeshrimp.com. Use promo code BONEYARD uh, to save a little money on your order. Again, that's primeshrimp.com, promo code BONEYARD. All right, time for today's top 10 list brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's my friend Blair Chandler. Go to C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R, CloseWithBlair.com. Blair is a mortgage professional. A lot of people out there kind of jockeying for your business, and rightfully so. Hey, that's that's what you'd want, right? You want somebody that's going to be aggressive. Hey, Hey, work with the winners, right? Stick with the winners. Blair, 21 years of experience in the industry. He is a mortgage professional. Top 1% close ratio nationally, two years running. He's a guy that knows how to get things done. He can tell you pretty much from first glance, okay, hey, we've got a marketable on here. We can put you in the pipeline and get you closed. The guy's got a great relationship with underwriters, understands how they speak and operate, what they have for lunch, kind of music they listen to, that sort of stuff. You need a guy to be your advocate or a lady. In this case, we're talking about a guy. But, uh, you know, Blair can go over there and kind of fight your case with the underwriters because he has a longstanding relationship. It's difficult at times to get mortgages approved. You need to have somebody fighting for you and not just another, line, another you know, name on an application somewhere. A lot of people just want to stack applications and hope for the best. Blair is a guy that look at, can look at your unique situation and structure a loan that not only uh, consolidates some debt and gives you an opportunity to live a little bit easier, but also, too, one that has an opportunity to get through underwriting. How about that? He'll get you to the closing table, if at all possible. Check him out today. Here's the thing, too. Blair wants to keep it in the family. Give Blair a text or call today at 601-500-2344. Again, that's 601-500-2344. And if you mention to him you heard about it on the boneyard, whether you tell him by, by you know, sky riding, uh, homing pigeon, whatever, singing telegram, whatever, text, call, email, He's going to pay for your appraisal. That's a great benefit. And we want to thank Blair for making that available to all of our listeners. Again, that's Boneyard listeners of all shapes, sizes, religious creeds, uh, college allegiances, whatever. Blair will work with you. An equal opportunity lender works with Fairway Mortgage, one of the top mortgage companies in America. Recently voted number one in customer satisfaction. So, Today's top 10 list is actually a request by a name you know, Aaron Fitt from D1 Baseball. Aaron and I were on a show this week. He was the guest before me, and because Aaron is my friend, they kind of brought me on, and we actually had a little uh, discussion about college baseball, about the SEC, and uh, yeah, pretty awesome stuff, you know. Uh, and listen, those guys at D1 Baseball and Baseball America, those guys are my friends, you know, Mike Rooney and Teddy Cahill and... Uh, Kendall Rogers, of course, and uh, hey, will we host? Um, and so the college baseball writing community is really kind of a fraternity, and, and I really like those guys a lot. So anytime I get a chance to kind of spend some time with him, I appreciate being able to do so and uh, really enjoyed having a chance to visit with him. And so he said, hey, how about a top 10? Give me your, your rain delay playlist. So we're going to do that today. The, the sunshine didn't shine on our dogs yesterday. So in honor of uh, that and my friendship with Aaron Fit, we're going to do the rain delay playlist today. Now, my list may be different than yours, and your list would be wrong. But this is a very, 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 very diverse list. There's a lot of songs on here that maybe you're unfamiliar with. Maybe there's some songs you've heard and didn't know who sang it. Uh, there is no B.J. Thomas on my list. 
raindrops keep falling on my head. If I ever hear it again, I'm taking hostages. I'm just telling you now. I'm sick of it, man. It's so cliche and boring. All due respect to BJ. But here is my top 10 songs that should be on every college baseball rain delay playlist. Number 10, we're going back into the, uh, the early days of 80s R&B. That's right. We're talking about the juice. Orange Juice Jones, The Rain. And if you're unfamiliar with the song, get familiar with it. Basically, it's a story about a guy goes to work, leaves a girl at home. She sneaks out with some dude. And uh, Orange Juice Jones sees her walking in the rain. They were holding hands, and I'll never be the same. Check it out. That song was everywhere, man. All right, number nine. Even though I completely disagree with this band being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it's a joke. I don't think I don't think non-rock bands should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I know they try to make that uh, as an inclusive a list as possible to get more people to go see there. Uh, I don't I don't know how many you know Eurythmics fans there are that just can't wait to go see that exhibit at the Hall of Fame. But whatever. But we're going with Here Comes the Rain again. Annie Lennox is an incredible singer, and uh, really kind of a adult contemporary type singer. I mean, her solo stuff is just magnificent. But here comes the rain again by the Eurythmics, your number nine song. Number eight, I've seen this band live, and I love Shirley Manson. Oh, she is so talented, has so much attitude. I, I dig I dig that so much. It's the band Garbage, and it's I'm Only Happy When It Rains. That's kind of a melancholy song, right? I'm Only Happy When It Rains. Number eight on your list. Number seven, a more recent phenomenon in music from across the pond. It's Adele set fire to the rain. I think Adele is incredibly talented. That's the thing that I think about. It's like, even though I'm a rock guy, I love people that can do things that I can't, you know, I can sing a little bit. These people can sing outstanding. And Adele in, in this generation, there are a few singers that are as talented as an accomplished as Adele. It's phenomenal. It really is. And for those of you that missed it, I can't remember if it was the Grammys or the American Music Awards or whatever, when uh, she won over Beyonce and she gave up, got up there and gave the big speech about how much she loves Beyonce and how great the Lemonade album was. I think it's, it shows a tremendous amount of class and respect among your peers. And uh, I, th- I thought it was a special moment, um, no doubt. All right, number six, I know they didn't sing it, but it's still, somebody sang it. Somebody did. Arista Records, uh, you know, put together this uh, this band, and uh, there was this great hoax. We're talking Millie Vanilli, Rob and Fab. I think Fabrice is still alive. I know Rob Pilatus has died kind of out of recovery. But it's blame it on the rain. you got to blame it on something. I still think the song is great. I don't care who sang it. Somebody sang it. And it's still a cool song. So whether you disagree or not, uh, I remember watching that behind the music. They said they knew once they won the Grammy, they were in trouble. And I remember even leading up to that, there were all these instances where they were caught lip singing, lip syncing at concerts, like the, the DAT, which digital audio tape is what it stood for, got stuck. They tried to play it off, but they were just kind of playing along. And people began to say, hey, they're lip syncing. Well, even back then... There were a lot of, especially pop artists, that would go perform like a pseudo live version and record it because there's so much dancing involved with pop music. And so there was a backing track. So people kind of made excuses for Millie Vanilli saying, well, that's what it is. I mean, everybody uses DAT. Everybody. And then little did we know, it was one of the greatest scandals in the history of American music. But blame it on the rain. Don't hate on the song. Number five, much different than the rest. This is uh, seven minutes of pure magic, man. Probably one of the more underappreciated songs in the Led Zeppelin catalog. I'm talking the rain song. It, it, it is just so eclectic and so atmospheric. I mean, it's like, it's just one of those songs that uh, you're riding down the road and it just kind of reminds you that, you know, life is, uh, life is pretty cool. The rain song by Led Zeppelin. That's your number five song. Number four, even though the uh, the word rain is not used very often in this song, 
we're going to throw it in there because anytime we can work Guns N' Roses into our list, we should. It's November Rain by Guns N' Roses. One of the most epic songs, really, of my generation. And the video was outstanding, too. Axl Rose was uh, dating Stephanie Seymour at the time, who, if I remember correctly, was a uh, SI swimsuit model. Uh, just a, you know, a phenomenal power couple at the time. And uh, she was kind of the love interest in the video. Very, very incredible video. Number four, November Rain, Guns N' Roses, because everybody needs some time alone. And after getting beat by 25 runs, I needed a lot of time alone. All right, number three, and you would say, Steve, how could you put this band ahead of Guns N' Roses when they were certainly a flash in the, in the uh, you know, the dye bottle bleach pan? But it's, uh, it's Nelson. And I did it because of the fact of the song, After the Rain. After the Rain is over, we get to play baseball. You know, you don't even play baseball in November. So it's like the November rain thing, it's a little bit out of context. But After the Rain from Nelson, which was their second single, the very first one was Love and Affection. And uh, there are not two finer uh, heads of hair, maybe in American music history, uh, than Gunnar Nelson and his brother. I forget his brother's name. But uh, After the Rain, fun song. And again, it's one of those songs to the video, kids, his kid, and his stepdad's yelling at his mom. And all of a sudden, the Nelson brothers are on this gigantic poster on his wall, and they come alive and pull him out of a dream sequence. And, you know, it's this song of empowerment and... Um, and the kid wakes up and he's like, yeah, I'm gonna, things are going to be okay. So it's a very positive song. Number two, you can't have a song about the rain without mentioning these fine folks from Mississippi. We're talking Blind Melvin that went to L.A. and, ran, and found Shannon Hoon, who was a friend from Indiana of Axl Rose from Guns N' Roses. As a matter of fact, Shannon Hoon is in the Don't Cry video when they're on top of the building and everything else. The guy singing back up is Shannon Hoon. So Blind Melvin goes to California Singer quits, they find Shannon Hoon, and next thing you know, Mouthful of Cavities, and then uh, debut album, all, all really good. I miss Blind Melon, but it's no rain. What's amazing to me, that uh, I talked to many young people today, and I mentioned Blind Melon to them. And I said, you, you don't know no rain? You had never seen a video of the B-Girl? Like, no, and I think, what an indictment on your parents. How did your parents never play No Rain from Blind? Surely they did, you just didn't remember it. And so maybe, just maybe, we as parents need to come together here and have an understanding. You need to make sure that you're playing good music for your kids. And I don't mean the Wiggles. I, listen, when they're old enough to kind of understand, you need to be rolling out some Blood Zeppelin, man. And maybe, maybe with younger ears, maybe Blind Melon is the way to go you got to be socializing your kids and not just leaving it up to TikTok. And part of that is introducing wonderful music into their lives. And I have kids all the time that tell me, hey, Steve, listen to the top ten list, added this, and kind of, my parents were surprised I was listening to this. It's outstanding. Uh, but my kids, I can tell you, their wealth of knowledge when it comes to music surpasses many of their peers. And I'm very proud of that. I think that's good parenting. So parents especially you uh, young couples of the 90s, if your kids don't know No Rain from Blind Melon, that is a personal failure. How about that? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Number one, I said this on the show. If you watch the show with me and Aaron Fit, there is no college baseball rain delay playlist that is complete without this song, and that is Rain from the Cult. You want a banger? You want a song that everybody can get behind? Because a lot of people are just kind of sitting around wanting to be entertained. This is it. And there's about 10 different versions of it on uh, Apple Music. I don't know which one's my favorite. I, I kind of like the one that just starts with uh, the bass drum just kind of kicking. Next thing you know, Billy Duffy comes in. But here comes the rain. It's a song about a girl. But it's fabulous. Absolutely love that song. It's one of my favorite cult songs. So there you go. My top 10 songs from the Rain Delay playlist. So hope you enjoy that. And again, we go anytime that we can go, we can work Orange Juice Jones into things and Millie Vanilli and Guns N' Roses and The Cult on the same list. I feel like we've done our jobs. I feel like, hey, hey, this is something for everybody, right? So enjoy it. Listen to it this weekend. But you're always looking for a playlist when you're out there working in the yard anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like you get done with the Boneyard podcast. You've listened to all the state podcasts. You're like, hey, I want to find something cool, maybe some music, here you go. Here's your rain delay playlist. 
be sure and check it out. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Book Mart. I love Campus Book Mart. You will too. Great people doing a great job to, for a great fan base, selling great merchandise at a great price. It's just great. How about that? Campus Book Mart. It's great. That should be a great slogan, like kind of bark through beer, right? Uh, so go by and see the lovely, talented Susie, Miss Kathy Brown, Miss Pam Menyard, the whole crew there. They'll take care of you. Uh, here's the thing, too. They got great selection, wonderful selection, uh, and, and an assortment of uh, Mississippi State sundries and items there. It's not just a T-shirt shop. There's a lot of other things there. Matter of fact, I bought my daughter, Audrey. I bought her diploma frame there at Campus Bookmark. Be sure and check that out. Maybe you've got a graduate in your life, and you're thinking, hey, I didn't think about that, Steve. It's a great graduation gift. And, and, and listen, let me tell you this. My personal advice, don't skimp on that. Go ahead and get a really good one. It's going to be up on the wall forever. So it's not going to be reframed someday. Whatever frame you buy, that's the one it's going to stay in. So go ahead and spend a little bit extra money. Whether you're the, the, the favorite aunt, the fun uncle, the grandparent, that's what you shoot for. Get that great diploma frame for your Mississippi State graduate. Uh, while you're there, too, pick up uh, a lot of Mississippi State merchandise. If you can't make it to town, visit them on the World Wide Web, courtesy of Al Gore's Internet at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That's BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks, saving you some money, informing you about Mississippi State sports, but saving you some money that you probably would spend otherwise. How about that? Free shipping. And any order less than 50 bucks, absolutely incomplete. Absolutely. Buy yourself something. Treat yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. Sometimes you got to buy your own birthday gift. I know I do. All right. So let's get to the next segment of the show. I've got to weigh in on this uh, Nick Saban, Jimbo Fisher thing. I know that all happened, you know, a day ago. Uh, it's surreal to me that uh, this is where we are. I think about you know this name, image, and likeness thing, and I go back. You know, people people forget, and I mentioned this. I wrote an article yesterday about about this topic, and you know people forget. You know this thing with Jimbo has been going on for a while now, and I am in no way making any allegations about Texas A and M because I don't know, I don't know, but I know that Lane Kiffin from Ole Miss, and I know Lane always has an opinion about everything. Uh, Lane. And Jimbo kind of went at each other back in February. You may recall that. You know, uh, Lane Kiffin was quoted as saying that, uh, hey, wonder if a and is going to have to pay a luxury tax on their class. And there's a little truth in every joke. And whether Lane kind of meant that off the cuff, either way, it registered because Jimbo responded to it. And Jimbo's like, hey, these guys out here complaining about this, and they're using it, blah, 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 and the transfer portal this. And, and then Kiffin, of course, has the Portal King shirt and all that kind of stuff. And that's the thing, too. What's interesting, too, it's kind of like, um, you know, you're the Portal King because you sign the most guys in the portal. It doesn't mean you necessarily sign the best guys in the portal. And, and like, say for an example, you know, Alabama's not a team that's going to go out and fill a bunch of needs in the portal. So they're never, they're never going to rank high in the portal rankings. And so it's kind of it's kind of a silly thing, to me. But I guess you know when, when you're one of the only programs in the SEC that hadn't been to the SEC championship game, you got to find something to cheer about. But uh, so that that was that had already happened, and which is kind of unprecedented in some respects. I mean, like you know, listen, Steve Spurrier. As much as you hated leaving, losing to Steve Spurrier, he was so good for our league, right? I mean, it was just so many things that he said. And even though most of them were kind of, uh, you know, off the cuff, right? You loved it because he provided so much color. But it was all, most of the time, good-natured. I'm going to read you some in case you've forgotten. Of course, I mentioned this in an article yesterday. You know, Florida State, the FSU stands at Free Shoes University. And, man, how far have we come now in college athletics giving the kid a pair of free shoes right now when I must be considered, uh, you know, an act of service? It's crazy. And so uh, talking about his own player, you know, Jadavion Clowney played at South Carolina. What a star he was, former number one player in the country. 
Uh, Jadavion Clowney had got a speeding ticket, and of course the media has an, an obligation to ask about it. Is he going to be suspended? What's going to be the course of action here? He goes, I didn't know Jadavion's car could go that fast. He doesn't have a pretty car like those Florida State guys used to drive. It's great. Talks about Georgia. Now, I remember this like it was yesterday, and when he said it, it was so funny. He goes, I always like playing them in that second game because you can always count on them having two or three key players suspended. You know? <laughs> Man, you got to love it. And then uh, makes a comment, too, about Georgia, you know, like uh, about them kind of like some other folks that we know that always have so much to say on signing day and then not so much to say on game day. Speaking of Georgia, why is it that during recruiting season they sign all the great players? When it comes time to play the game, we have the great players. I don't understand that. What happened to theirs? Let's skip – oh, yeah, and he made the comment, too, that this, this this was a legendary comment. I don't know if it originated with Steve Spurrier when they had the fire – remember the fire game between Auburn and LSU, Thursday night game, and the Auburn library caught on fire, and they say it destroyed 20 books. And Spurrier says the real tragedy is that 15 of them hadn't been colored in yet. Again, I don't know if it originates with him, but it was still very funny. Um, and he always had something to say about, about uh, Tennessee. And that's the rival school, right? I mean, so he always had something to say about Phil Fulmer, and it's like he's rubbing his nose in it. But it was funny. It was humorous. Well, it'll be the 14th time I've coached in the UN Stadium. I've coached there more than some of their head coaches. That's a great line. Hey, in Knoxville, they're still doing cartwheels because they went 7-6 and six and won a ball game. I remember when Florida and Tennessee was the game of the year. You remember Jafar, Jabar, Jafar Gaffney? Caught that ball for like half a second and they gave him a touchdown. Ended up being the game winner. And then uh, they asked Spurrier about Tennessee's inability to get their sugar bowl. And he goes, well, you can't spell citrus without UT. to my Florida citrus bowl. Pretty awesome. Some of the better comments, too, were about Alabama. He goes, in 12 years at Florida, I don't think we ever signed a kid from the state of Alabama. Of course, we found out later that their scholarships at Alabama were worth a lot more than ours. Of course, that's when Alabama went on probation. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's good stuff. But, see, that's the thing, too. It's like we even now we can laugh about that stuff. We can laugh about those comments because, you know, while they're a little bit uncouth, they're funny. They're not petty and personal. They're just kind of silly. But what we saw this week was just kind of a horse of a different color. You got Nick Saban, arguably the greatest college football coach of all time. I don't know how you could argue against that at this point. With seven NFL championships, one at LSU, six at Alabama. Coming out and naming Texas A&M. It's one thing to just say, hey, this is kind of where things are going with NIL and a transfer portal. And, you know, you've got some schools out there that are offering NIL money to get kids to come play for them. It's a pay-for-play thing. But to name a school, and uh, I remember when all this first started, you know, you know, Nick and those guys were out there talking about all this money their players were going to make, and he said that they generated $3 million of NIL money last year. And you know, the thing that I think about with Alabama is like, and, and there are so many people that say, well, you know, Alabama's the best cheaters in college sports. I, I don't know that. I know that they have some issues like everybody else. But I have heard in my coverage of recruiting, uh, you know, in the last 25 years, that Nick Saban has told kids, too, it's like, hey, you can make uh, – you can sign for them with, for 10000 or come here and make $10 million. You come in here and work hard and become an NFL player. And so, you know, he's not looking for the sucker for the cheap reward. And, and that's not – again, not to say there aren't people out there that it's impossible to govern all that stuff. But for him to come out there and name names – and, and does this go back to last year when Jimbo said we're going to beat Alabama and then did? And Alabama finishes number two in the country in recruiting behind A&M. And listen, A&M did beat Alabama last year, and it was amazing. We all watched it. That kid knocked that field goal through. It was a c- complete shocker. We'd beaten them the, year, the, the game before, and we thought Alabama will just absolutely train wreck these guys. They didn't. And so maybe that kind of stems from that. And, again, A&M beat Alabama and then lose to Arkansas, Ole Miss, and Mississippi State the same year. 
So you can't even really celebrate that as much as you'd like to because, yes, you were all in to beat Alabama, but then you lost to your contemporaries. And a lot of people say, well, you know, A&M's a rising power. Man, I've been hearing that the whole 10 years they've been in the league. And they have yet to make it to the SEC championship game. I think in many respects, many A&M people feel like they should be Alabama. It's like, hey, we have the second largest budget in the country, only behind Texas, our big brothers. We're spending more money. We're investing more. You know, we, we have this uh, cool thing we do. Where we all hold hands and sing a song. Why aren't we Alabama? Why aren't we getting to Atlanta? Why aren't we in the New Year's Six Bowls regularly? Why aren't we in the playoffs? And so you go pick a fight with Nick Saban kind of behind the scenes, and now all of a sudden it appears that that's getting to Nick, which is rare. And listen, I'm a huge Nick Saban fan. I I certainly hate playing Alabama. I do, which is the greatest compliment I think you can give somebody is say, I I don't like playing them because they're going to beat us, and I'm a competitor. I get it. But the fact that Nick Saban, in many respects, was kind of out of character. And I know he's in a room with, with friends, but the cameras are rolling. And, you know, Nick's at a point, too, at you know, 70 years of age or whatever he is now, he doesn't care. He's going to say whatever he wants to say. And that's just kind of how things are going to roll. You know, he's made his money. He, his legacy is established. But in some ways, I think this is not really consistent with his character which makes it all the more surprising. And so that news kind of broke about 11 o'clock Wednesday. And then we get up Thursday morning. Let me back up a second. Even before that, the news breaks, and then there's Deion Sanders responding because you know Nick Saban took a swipe at Deion Sanders and Jackson State and Travis Hunter. And you remember when all that first came out, you know, it was like what Penn wagering and Barstool Sports, and like initially everybody's like, "Hey, this is what happened," and they're like, "Oh no, 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 no that didn't happen." And so I'm a conspiracy theorist, so yeah, I believe something happened. The number one recruit in America went to Jackson State. It's a pretty crazy story. All due respect to Dion and Jackson State, and I think there are some things that have been said that are kind of insulting in many respects. But the fact that you can't be surprised that other people look at that and kind of like, ah, I don't know. And you know what? Maybe it all is above board. Maybe it is. I don't know. Somebody should dig into it, though. And that's the thing about a story this big. I'm sure somebody is. And at some point, you don't think there's some enterprising journalist in the panhandle of Florida that's affiliated with Florida State. It's not thinking, yep, at some point, they're going to slip up and I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. Could be some gotcha journalism. We're going to make some things happen. And so Dion responds and says, yeah, you better believe I'm going to take care of that lie. And again, I don't know what's true and what's untrue. I'm not taking sides in this thing. I'm just kind of, we're just we're talking through it together. So we wake up Wednesday morning, or Thursday morning, excuse me, and there's news that A&M is going to have a press conference. You know, you know, listen, it's not hard to do a press conference. You know, you just send out a tweet or you send out, you know, we have like a group me message at Mississippi State. And so they sent out a message and said, hey, so-and-so is going to meet with the media at this time on this day. To do one that early in the morning is, is pretty rare. It is pretty rare because you, you know, the reason you do a press conference is to get the press there. And so I, I would suspect that they probably reached out to their TV stations and their media partners probably that night or early that morning and said, hey, we're going to do something today. Not exactly sure of the timing, but it'll be this morning. And uh, Jimbo clearly wanted to get it done before lunch. And I think he, I don't think he planned to take questions. I think he wanted to go out there and kind of lay the hammer down and get up and walk away where he made his little comment, you know, about when people show you who they are, believe them. And uh, I believe that was Maya Angelou that coined that phrase rather than Jimbo Fisher's dad. All that said, the next thing you know, we've got Jimbo Fisher planting his back foot and laying haymakers. This guy's talking about, hey, the narcissist in him won't admit this. And there's this and there's that, and he's insecure, and he, you, you call him the czar of college football, and you, you think he's a god, but go look how God kind of built his legacy. Go talk to anybody that ever worked with him. You'll find some things out you don't want to know. Jimbo, I want to know. 
I'm an inquiring mind. I think everybody in college football wants to know. Say so, hey, the DMs are open, man. You got if you got allegations, if you have proof of a violation, let a brother know. I'm not scared. I'll write the story. You can back it up. Absolutely. Not that I think Jimbo listens, but uh, my point being is that, and this is kind of the point of my article yesterday, is you got Alabama out there accusing A&M of major recruiting violations. You see, Steve, NIL is legal, not in part of the, it's part of the recruiting process. Now, you could argue that maybe it should be. I'll argue that it shouldn't. But I think it's almost impossible to police that and enforce that rule. But that's the rule. If you don't like the rule, then perhaps petition your league president to go out there and change it. But that's the rule, and that's the rule that everybody agreed to, that NIL would not be a part of recruiting athletes. And here's the thing, too. If you go read the state laws, and uh, if memory serves me correct, there are 26 states that have an NIL law on the books. Now, I haven't read them all, but the overwhelming majority of them say you can't make an NIL deal with a minor. You can't make an NIL deal with a guy that hasn't enrolled in in school, at college. That's the law in Mississippi. You can't do it. You can't facilitate that as part of your recruiting pitch. Now, is that that to say that, you know what, a guy's going to go and sit with a coach and say, hey, you know, listen, we can't really talk NIL with you, but here's somebody that can. Here's a number. Call him. They can tell you. And, of course, you've already primed the pump, right? I've already called John Q. NIL rep and said, hey, we're going to be hosting, you know, Sammy Ellis' grandson this weekend, and I'm going to have him call you, and we need this kid. So could you work some uh, angles and go ahead and maybe speak to some guys at the collective or speak to some businesses out there that are Mississippi State friendly that will put together an NIL package for this guy? So when the kid makes the call and his family – We've already had a great visit to campus, and now we make the call to this agent, and he's already been working on your behalf, and he's like, hey, you, you come to Mississippi State, you know, we've already got you know $20,000 in NIL money set aside for you. This is going to happen. That's the workaround. But what's happening now is not like that. I mean, you, you've read with great interest, you know, The Athletic and those guys, they, they actually – had documents they didn't release the documents themselves but according to their reporting they had actually signed contracts between recruits and nil operatives for hundreds of thousands of dollars and i think nick saban makes a good point too you're going to get out there and you're going to pay some kid to go to your school and he's going to transfer you're like wait a minute do i get my money back no you don't You don't get your money back. You just made a deposit and learned a valuable lesson in life. A non-refundable deposit at that. So Greg Sankey releases a statement. I know that according to Ross Dellinger's report that Ross Bjork had uh, had complained to the league that Saban was out of line. He and he was. But so was Jimbo Fisher. In fact, I think Jimbo's comments yesterday – were probably a little more salty, a little more personal, because it wasn't really necessarily about the NIL. It was about Nick Saban as a person, and he attacked his professional credibility. He attacked his integrity. So both of them were at fault. And so I'm sure Bjork and him were thinking, we won't say been sanctioned, or we won't say been reprimanded by the league. Well, both of them got reprimanded, and both of them earned it. It's incredible theater. And you start thinking, man, I can't wait till we start playing football again. And I'm – I'm sad about baseball season, but I'm eager for football season to get here. If we're going to have this kind of drama, goodness. It's not a good look for the league, though. It's a terrible look for the league to have two of the highest paid coaches at two of the greatest and biggest universities in our league out here trading barbs publicly with the cameras rolling. I know it fires up the fan bases, but there's a way to do things and there's a way not to do things. Now, I have a lot of confidence in Greg Sankey. I have very little confidence in the NCAA. Now, the thing that I will say is Greg Sankey is the most powerful man in college sports. I don't think anybody could disagree with that. That's why Greg Sankey and uh, Julie Cromer are heading up the NCAA Transformation Committee. You have an agent for change, and then you have the female AD 
from a G5 conference. And so you've kind of got everybody, everybody is represented in many respects here. And I think it's important to have, uh, you know, Cromer on the committee because, you know, let's be honest, the challenges of a G5 are different than that at a Power 5. They don't have the same budget. They don't have the same, uh, you know, resources that we do here in the Power 5. And so it's great that they're being represented. And if you've read some of the reports, they're out there available to anybody who wants to go see them. And they talk about their agenda and what they talk about. I wrote about that too recently. But all that information is out there and it's available for you for free. But if anybody is going to kind of be an agent for change in this deal to kind of get the NIL stuff done, it's going to be Greg Zanke. You know, Greg Zanke and the uh, Pac-12 uh, commissioner recently visited Washington, D.C. to kind of lobby some U.S. senators to kind of put some support together. And some people would say, Steve, do we really want the federal government involved in this? They already are. And, and they probably have to be now because there are so many state governments that are involved in this. And state laws vary state to state. What's legal in one state is not legal in the other. So you don't have a competitive and equitable playing field when it comes to NIL. What's legal in one state? And all of a sudden, there may be, there may be somebody out there, let's say, you know, New Mexico. Maybe New Mexico decides, you know what, we're going to get serious about football. We're going to get ultra serious about football. And we're, we're going to make it legal to pay players to come play here. And we're going to make it legal for the university to be involved in that process. We're going to make it legal. That's our state law. And NCAA, their bylaws don't supersede our state law. So now all of a sudden, you can get paid to play. You get your scholarship. You get your stipend. You get your house and money. You get uh, your cost of living. You get all that stuff. And we're going to pay you. Now, I'm not saying it's going to upset the balance of power in college football. But now all of a sudden, they're going to rise to be powers at their own level. And now all of a sudden, recruiting becomes a real fiasco for the states around them, their competitors in their own conference. Well, we can't do that. Oh, well, so I can go to this school and get tuition and books and, you know, have with everybody else. Or I can go to New Mexico school and get all of this and then, uh, you know, get fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year in salary. Well, that's a no-brainer, especially if I have no allegiance to either school. It's a matter of economics. And so it's important to get a handle on this. And, and Sankey says, hey, we're going to talk about that uh, at the spring meetings. That happens uh, Memorial Day weekend. That'll be, be awfully interesting. Wouldn't you love to be in the room? I don't think Jimbo is scared of Nick. I don't. And it's one thing to do it behind the camera you know, when you're behind the dais and that kind of stuff. I don't think Jimbo is scared of Nick, and I think the fact that they beat Nick last year, I think they're thinking, you know what, hey, we're coming, Nick, and you're just crying because we beat you, then we beat you in recruiting, and we've been smarter than you. We have done it smarter than you. One comment I thought was interesting, too. You know, Ross Bjork, again, Ross has never met a microphone he didn't like. Uh, Ross was quoted in a Ross Dellinger article as saying, hey, I'm paraphrasing, but he says uh, to suggest that that's the only reason – the kids are using choosing Texas A&M, uh, it's not accurate. Well, it's illegal to use NIL to recruit. So it shouldn't be any reason, not the only reason. And so I don't know if Ross misspoke. I don't know maybe if the emotion of the moment kind of got to him. You know, maybe it's just like defending his university and his guy, as he should. But I thought, you know, the, the phrasing there was awfully interesting. Well, that's not the only reason. To suggest that is the only reason, I don't think that anybody said that's the only reason they went to A&M. I mean, A&M's got a great program. They've been fairly mundane in our league, but, I mean, you know, A&M is A&M. It's a bigger version of Mississippi State in many respects. But you know, my point being is that if it's a factor at all, it's illegal. And if the NCAA is going to have this rule on the books, they got to enforce it. And some would say, well, Steve, how do you curtail all this? I have that answer, too. You make an example out of somebody. And maybe you do it in every region of the country. You find these guys that have wantonly broken the rules. And we all knew. You can say, but, Steve, there aren't any rules. Well, one of the rules in the interim policy that was instituted when the NIL was made legal around the country was that it would not be tied to recruiting. Well, 
as Nick Saban said, and he's right, coaches and others have found a way to make this something to their advantage. So the reality of it is, is you have people out there knowingly and willingly skirting the rules, enforce the rule. And I don't mean to slap somebody on the hand. I mean make it serious. And I mean don't let the players transfer. Like if anybody that accepted money, uh, you can't transfer. And if you can transfer, you waive your, in, your uh, immediate eligibility. You got to go sit. And maybe we even ding you some eligibility. You remember what would happen with Renardo Sidney? Remember that? Never even found a real al- uh, any supporting evidence to sustain the uh, allegation or, to, or to, uh, to confirm the allegation. And he still lost some eligibility. So cut some guys, make the players accountable too. And then make the boosters accountable. Disassociate those boosters. And, you know, this, well, that doesn't stop them from going to the ballgame. Well, that's true, but it does stop them from being involved, and it stops them from having access to your coaches in many respects. And then you punish the institution. And I'm not talking about a year probation. I'm talking three or four years probation, two or three years bowl bans, dock them 15, 20 scholarships, a couple of years. That'll fix it. You have to make people realize this is not worth it. You got to enforce the rules, and when you when you when you basically only have one rule, and they break the rule, and you've got players out here signing with schools for hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's an impermissible benefit. That that by law is already on the books, and people could say, "But Steve, there'll be all these lawsuits." That's going to happen either way. You have to protect the integrity of the game at this point. That's where we are. There's no question about it. College athletics as a whole is at stake here. So you got to go out there and make some things happen. You can't just sit back and say, well, it'll work itself out. And like I read some of these comments too, people say, well, you just got to adjust. No, you don't. Let's be honest about this, okay? How many millionaires are involved with Texas A&M athletics? How many millionaires are involved with Vanderbilt athletics for that matter. How would we ever compete? You know, what if some school out there that specializes in academia decides, you know what, hey, we're going to get really serious about football. And since the NCAA is not going to do anything about this, we're just going to start uh, mobilizing our donors and we're going to raise tens of millions of dollars or we'll take some money out of our endowment and we'll just start paying these players to come here instead of going elsewhere. That's the alternative. So you got to enforce a rule. And that's something the NCAA has struggled with. You know, they restructured things a few years ago to give you the penalty matrix, supposedly to streamline cases, to make it easier. And even that, it's not enforced. And that's what happens. I mean, it's kind of like being the parent, right? If you tell your kid, okay, if you do this, you're grounded two weeks. And then they do it, and you're like, okay, this is your last warning. No, no, no. How would your kid ever respect you? How do you socialize your child without accountability? There has to be a level of accountability. And so the solution to this is very simple. People don't like it, but the solution is very simple. The NCAA drug their feet, led by Mark Emmert, who will go down, I think, is one of the worst presidents of the NCAA. I think when you look back in hindsight, I mean, this is his legacy. He has left college athletics on fire due to his own inaction. Now, he was in, you know, he had no trouble canceling the rest of college baseball and softball season, canceling all the spring sports. You know, we didn't even have hard data back yet about the COVID-19 virus, and they just go ahead and just immediately shut everything down. We couldn't wait. We couldn't find a possible solution. Let's just shut it down. We're going to be hard-handed about this in the name of player safety. And as noble as that may be, it was a reckless decision. You could have played the games. Maybe you play them without spectators. You could have done something, and the nation needed that. 
And you could have had some players, you know what, I'm going to opt out. I just don't feel comfortable. And that's fine too. But you, could have, you still could have played the games. You absolutely could have. You could have given it some time to figure out a proper testing protocol. And you could have let guys make a decision. And ladies, you could have done that, but you didn't. So we rushed to make a decision there. But then when something like this, that is not a temporary situation, something that in many respects is considered final and permanent, now all of a sudden our ability to make a decision and our willingness to make a decision is absent. That's terrible leadership. The reason we have leaders is so they can make decisions. Good leaders make decisions quickly, but they also gather information. I go back and I think about Greg Sankey. Remember, and I remember this like it was yesterday, and it irritated me to no end. And I remember talking to some people closer to the situation who said, Steve, we need a miracle. When the Pac-12 and the Big Ten says, you know what, we're not going to play football in 2020. You had all of these media personalities that are often in error but never in doubt. And, and, and there are some people involved with, uh, you know, the coverage of college athletics that are about as dumb as a box of rocks. And you're, oh, it's going to be this. It's going to be a dark day in college football tomorrow. Well, then, then next thing you know, Greg Sankey's like, well, you know what, let's, let's kind of wait and see here. Let's kind of wait and see. Well, then the ACC was like, hey, we agree with Sankey and the SEC. Let's wait. And let's collect some data. Let's rely on our medical experts. And then the ACC and the SEC persuaded the Big 12 to say, hey, let's, let's do this thing. Well, then all of a sudden, everybody else kind of comes back around. I think I guess the Ivy League was the only one that didn't play. And then these minor conferences are like, hey, we're going to play too. And this makes sense. We'll put this testing protocol together. We'll have contact tracing, which was kind of silly too. But it's what we had to endure in order to have college football. We had a great season. We crowned an AFL champion, and the nation needed it. College campuses needed it. And we all look back in hindsight now and say, you know, it makes me really grateful for college sports. I would remind those that said when they canceled college baseball season in 2020, you said then, I'll never complain again. I just want to be out at Duty Noble Field to watch my team play. Well, They didn't hold that promise, did they? (laughs) But I digress. But to me, all this is very simple. It is a convoluted process, and it's complicated because there are so many state governments involved in this thing. But the NCAA, in many respects, holds a power. It is a voluntary organization. And when every player signs a scholarship, there is a, a code of conduct. And there's documents that they sign saying that, hey, I understand the NCAA, I agree to adhere to the NCAA rules. So you know the rules when you join the organization or you like to go play at an NCAA member institution. You understand that going in, hey, this is the deal. That's not to say that it's always been correct because it hadn't been. But you don't get to renegotiate the deal halfway through the process. The NCAA again, is a volunteer organization that schools are a part of. They're part of a conference. They're part of the NCAA. They're a member institution because they adhere to the principles and the rules set forth by the NCAA. You don't have to play. No one is guaranteed the opportunity to play NCAA sports. Nobody. It is not a right. It is a privilege. And so all of a sudden, we take a privilege – And then we want to talk about the rights that we should hold within the privilege of playing college sports. The NCAA should just simply say, this is how it's going to be. This is how we're going to manage NIL. These are the rules. These are the parameters. And if you violate that, you can't play. It's pretty simple. People are scared to say it, but it's pretty simple. You don't have to sit back and just say, okay, well, what do the players want to do? Okay, it... At some point, you got to be the adults in the room. And that is in no way to diminish you know, the feelings of our student athletes. We have become very, 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 very athlete centric in recent years. That's why we have the immediate transfer. That's why we have a transfer portal. We'll make it easier for players to kind of move on to other schools if they get into a bad situation or perhaps one they're not going to play much into what they feel is a better situation. But there are a lot of people now, and I had a college coach tell me this recently, 
there are players going into the portal and then collecting NIL money from other people and then pulling out of the portal. So it's like they're cashing in. And, I, hey, I can't knock the hustle. But at the same time, too, how is that not considered an impermissible benefit? They're gaming the system. So if you have people doing that, then dock their eligibility. If you got donors out there that are involved in that process, remove their access. To me, it's all pretty simple. And again, if nothing else, maybe this dialogue, this fiery rhetoric we've had from Fisher and Sabin, maybe will bring some real teeth to these discussions because this is an embarrassing look for the SEC and college athletics as a whole. Let's thank our friend Brooks Bryan. That's a guy, too, that will always stand up for you. Brooks is a guy, former Diamond Dog, and I hate to say it that way because it's a lifelong designation. No doubt about it. But Brooks is a guy that's uh, wanting to make Starville a better place to live. No doubt about it. That's what he does. It's what he enjoys. Uh, you can give Brooks a call today at 601-416-8075. 601-416-8075. I can promise you he has some hot takes about name, image, and likeness. But that's not why you're calling. You're calling to get more information about Portico. Portico, a great place to live, just 1.1 miles away from the Mississippi State campus. How cool is that? On the quiet side of campus, too, so you're close enough for convenience but far enough away to have a little privacy. That's the best of both worlds right there. If I was moving to Starkville, I would move to Portico, and we would be neighbors. How about that? We'd be neighbors. And that way, when I played uh, some obscure 80s rock at loud volumes in the afternoon, you could come home and say, hey, Steve's home. But I'm out here in the sticks, but if I was moving there now, that's where I'd move Portico. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath home, go up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home. Maybe you're looking to downsize. Maybe you're looking to have like a ball game weekend retreat and have a place where the kids can always come and stay with mom and dad and enjoy Mississippi State sports. A lot of people say, hey, I've got a place in Starkville. A lot of people want a place in Starkville. Secure your place in Starkville by giving Brooks Bryan a call today. You'll be glad you did. Make Portico your next move. All right, let's look around the league. Yeah, it, it's beginning to matter less and less, right? I mean, you know, our, we're basically now in a situation we got to win two games uh, just to make this thing, uh, you know, a possibility here. And, you know, you know Kentucky uh, leading Auburn at this point, too. It's uh, pretty crazy how it's working, too. I mean, you know, we've we got to make some things happen, certainly. So if, I'm, if I can get this stupid schedule to work here, uh, there's so much of that that um, – and technology, you know, we, we get excited about that. Things don't always go the way we'd like. So Auburn and Kentucky was suspended. Kentucky's winning that game. Missouri beats Georgia last night 11-3. Didn't expect that to happen. I won't repeat the Mississippi State score. It's just too painful. Florida, 14-5 winners over South Carolina. Arkansas takes down Bama 7-3. Uh, LSU, 13-2 winners in Nashville over Vanderbilt. I'm telling you, Vanderbilt's a fraud. Texas A&M, 10-5 winners over Ole Miss. And have you seen this? There was It got things, got a little chirpy late in that ballgame. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. So it was an interesting game. It was very competitive for a while. A&M jumps out to a 7-0 lead. Maybe you didn't see that coming. We, we Listen, we know, hey, a and M's playing good baseball, and listen, they're not great at anything, but they're really good at everything. They don't necessarily have a flaw. Delucia has been outstanding for Ole Miss. He goes one and two thirds of an inning. A and M gets seven runs on five hits. Three of those are earned. Four walks, a K, give up a home run. So they they go right after who has proven to been Ole Miss's best starter the last month. Uh, Jack Doherty comes on. Doesn't give up any runs, goes two and two-thirds of an inning, five hits, no runs, a walk in four Ks. And then again, it's Nichols. Nichols gives up a run. And then Josh Gaddis gives up back-to-back home runs. And uh, I don't know what was said, so I'm not going to judge anybody for that. But apparently after a home run, uh, so Gaddis tried the quick pitch rock from A&M. And then A&M's rock hits it in the right center for home run. And around the bases, Peyton Chaudnier, because, you know, he was signed just so Ole Miss fans can say Chaudnier. For some reason, Chaudnier took offense. I don't know if maybe he said something, or maybe it was just the reality of, hey, we're not really as good as we think we are. 
But Chardonnay starts kind of chasing after him. I think to myself, you know, it's like it's like a banny rooster out there in, in the barnyard. I mean, what, what are you going to do to anybody? You kidding me? You're going to run your mouth. And so the next guy gets plunked. Gaddis squares him up in the ribs. Uh, listen, I get it in some respects. I, you know, I, I guess I believe in baseball justice. And again, I don't know what was said, but I thought it's a Bush League thing. You know, it's like you get rocked and then you plunk the next guy. You know, I know Lamontis is one of those guys, too, that's like, you know, hey, just get him out. You know, let's just get him done here. You know, the, you know, the best revenge is living well, right? And so, you know, all this happens, you know, in the ninth. And um, so everything, you know, so <laughs> top of nine, Wonder flies out to center, Moss homers, Rock homers, and then both benches were given warnings. So apparently, you know, something got really chirpy there. And then Gaddis plunks him. He's ejected. Then Bianco was ejected. They bring in uh, another pitcher and eventually get out of the inning. But um, but the reality of it is, is like, you know, so what happens now? You know, Gaddis is now suspended. What is it, four games? Bianco should be suspended. I'm sure he'll appeal that. I'm not exactly sure what the protocol is for that now. But uh, this could be awfully interesting. But again, A&M gets up 7-0, then Ole Miss scores three in the second to make it a game again. Ole Miss scores in the fourth. Now it's a 7-4 ball game. They add one in the six, it's 7-5, and you're thinking, okay, they're going to sneak back in this thing and win it. And then A&M gets an insurance run in the eighth, and there's two tanks there in the ninth. Uh, Ten runs on 14 hits. Ole Miss made a couple errors in the ball game. But, uh, you know, interesting. Interesting to say the least. Now let's take a quick look at the standings. And you're going to say, Steve, what does that mean for us? Well, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, you know, we're, we're now tied with Missouri, 9-19. They hold the tiebreaker over us. So we got to avoid a tie with them. Alabama, 10-17. and 17, We hold the tiebreaker over them, but it is impossible to tie them because of the fact that they played one less game. So we got to win two to pass those guys. We got to win two and hope they lose at least. Uh, probably got to lose them both. Um, but you know we've got to find a way to not be in a tie with Missouri. Missouri, we need Georgia to come back and, and win these next two. And um, you know Kentucky looks like they're about to get win number eleven, which would be awfully interesting. So in order for us to win the series, we have to win the series and to, to force a tie with them. And then I don't know where the tiebreaker goes after Tennessee because we would both have beaten Tennessee twice. And, you know, I mean, at this point, we're just kind of talking about possibilities. We're not talking about what I think is going to happen. But the reality of it is, is it has been a very disappointing season for Mississippi State. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about that. We can make excuses. And listen, here's the things too. It's like, you know, a lot of times there are things that happen that are reasons. And it is impossible to think about this season and discount the injuries. But that said – this is Mississippi State. We should have guys, even down the pen, that are young and talented that can go out there and get guys out. Guys, will we give seven home runs last night? Now, I understand Tennessee's a machine. I get it. But we should not be in this bad a situation pitching-wise. We just shouldn't be. we got to address that. And we've had some recruiting misses. We've had some guys get hurt. And it's all kind of came together and culminated this in this just dreadful season for us. But we don't need to go fire Scott Fox. So I see all those tweets and post game, and, and, and I get it, you know, because your heart is in the right place. You don't always know how to maybe properly articulate your feelings. There's Scott Fox all last year, considered by many to be the greatest assistant coach in college baseball last year. It's amazing in one year to the next how people's opinions um, – have changed. And so let's give it a little time. You know, uh, look at the portal. You know, I've been told that, uh, you know, we're going to go out there and get two to three pitchers, still looking for a middle infielder, probably a center fielder. And we'll see how things go. You know, looking at the draft numbers and talking to people too. I mean, I, I think we're going to have m- the overall majority of our, of our guys come to class. You know, Jet, Jet's a uh, probably a first-rounder out of Texas that was expected to be – you know, middle infielder for us. I don't expect him to show up for school. You got a fighting chance. You know, Lofton, a guy that's uh, getting some talk. Uh, talked to Ross Highfield recently. I, I think basically what's going to boil down to Ross is like, if he, if he gets a first-round selection and gets some money he wants, yeah, he's going to go. 
But I think this kid really wants to come to Mississippi State. Unless he gets life-changing money, I think he's going to be a Bulldog. And I think he is going to be a guy that's going to play very early for us. Uh, actually, I got his uh, end-of-the-year stats right here. Let me share them with you. How about that? And, again, it's high school. I get it. Okay, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, but he hit 380 this year, 510 on base percentage. I like a guy that's willing to walk. Uh, led the team in most offensive categories. He had uh, nine doubles, four triples, six home runs, and 32 RBI. That's a guy. That's a guy that, uh, that could help us. And we need him here. We do. And uh, I look at this class, and, again, it's not just going to be enough, right? I mean, because, you know, there's a learning curve for freshmen. So you've got to bring in this influx of talent from the recruiting side, but also, too, from the portal. Uh, I don't expect there to be a catcher in the portal. I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen with Luke. I think some of our guys, and I, I read a lot of stuff online, and people are like, hey, this is going to happen. You know, some of these guys' age is kind of their enemy. You know, you, you get to be 22, 23 years of age, you know, you need to be in the minors. I mean, if you're, if you're hoping to make it one day to the show – you need to be in the minors. And so you have these guys that, uh, that maybe have two years of eligibility because of the COVID year, but yet they're 22 years of age. And so they're going to have to be, you know, very judicious in their thinking and kind of figuring this thing out. You know, that's, that's the thing you think about now is, you know, what's best for Mississippi State may not be best for an individual player. Now, Kellum Clark – and I've had some discussions about him as of late. Barring something really crazy, he's back next year. It needs to be. You begin to think about, okay, you've got Hunter Hines and Kelvin Clark coming back, and Hunter is not draft eligible for two more years. So you, you know, should get used to him being here. Uh, but Kelvin Clark is the guy, too. Again, unless something crazy happens, he's back. And I read these things from time to time, and I, I know you learn to take it all with a grain of salt. A lot of people you know, claim to have you know, people in the know. Uh, and sometimes I know people in the know that aren't honest. But um, – the reality of it is, is that uh, I've spoken to enough people that, you know, I feel confident that, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of the team back, but there are going to be some guys, some guys that you want to come back that, that won't be because they have to think about what's best for their future. And so Chris Lamonis has to consider that too when he begins to kind of put together a roster for next year, when they start thinking about, okay, what are our needs in the portal and what are our needs recruiting-wise? And you have some guys too that have been committed to Mississippi State now for a year longer that have been offered scholarship money, and there's a you know, big scholarship money that's already been agreed to, well, you, you can't go back and renege on that deal. And so it, it's got to be both. I read these things, people say, oh, we got to go get a dozen guys in the portal. You know, n- n- no, we don't. And that's not sustainable anyway. Number one, you only have nine players, right? Uh, but you can't go out there and sign a full team in the portal, you know, because h- how many of those guys are going to be better than what you have? You go out there and you find uh, – some starters from the G5 level that are potential MLB prospects. And that's and you can find a lot of those guys pitching-wise. You know, like the kid that pitched for for uh, for Tennessee last night that no hit us for six innings. Yeah, he was at Georgia Southern last year. And then he's out there just digging in the SEC. And so there are guys that develop at different rates – and maybe they've got on the college level, they've gotten a weight room for the first time, and maybe they're focused on baseball only for the first time in their lives and they're taking off. Uh, those are the guys we got to go get. And you can't go poach them. you got to get them out of the portal. But there are some guys out there that can come in here and help us. And so it's got to be a combination of both. You can't go just, oh, we're going to just gut the team and just go sign a bunch of guys in the portal that don't know each other, that have no chemistry, uh, that may not even mesh with what we want to do. So, again – you got to get some immediate impact guys, but by and large, you got to build a program on your high school recruiting. You know, that, that's the way it has to be. And I think that's really across all sports. And basketball is a little bit different. I mean, basketball is almost like junior college, the way this portal thing's working. But college baseball is much different. It's much different because it is is really a game of development. There are a lot of guys in basketball that get by on being a superior athlete. They may not have the best basketball IQ, but they're guys that can really get out there and hoop. Baseball is a much different thing. Baseball is very much a developmental game. And all of a sudden you get too reliant on a portal and then you end up having a bad class. Well, now all of a sudden these guys are gone and you have no younger guys behind them who have developed in the pipeline to take over. So, again, you've got to supplement where you have holes 
But by and large, I think you've got to continue to focus on high school recruiting. People say, oh, well, you know, Tennessee did this and Arkansas did that. But if you go look, too, you know, we're just talking about a couple guys. You know, it's like you know them because they've been like Michael Turner to Arkansas. The guy's outstanding. He's an outstanding player because he plays catcher. You know, and, and this is a guy, too, it's been a really heavy left-handed bat for them. But it's not like Arkansas was devoid of talent. They returned some very talented players. Julian Battles, Bob Moore, Hayden Webb. You know, they had a lot of guys coming back. And so you go find some guys that supplement what you have returning and what you have coming in. You've got a magical formula. That's the challenge for Chris Simonis right now. You've got you to hit on the few guys you get out of the portal, but you need these young guys to come in here ready to play. And also, too, you need the guys that are returning, developing and becoming better guys. And, uh, you know, I hear that we have some guys, too, that uh, may not go play summer league baseball in the Cape this year. They may stay here in Starkville and, and, and just work out and get better. You know, some of that guy, some of these guys need – younger guys especially need to go get reps. You know, if Kellen Clark didn't go play in the Cape this year, I think that's perfectly fine. If Hunter Hines didn't go play in the Cape, I think that's perfectly fine. But these younger guys, guys like, um, you know, Trey Higgins, Revy Higgins, that guy needs reps. So he probably needs to go play – Summer League Baseball. There are other guys who just need to get bigger and stronger, spend some time in the cage. Uh, and it's you know, as hard as it is on all of us, just think about how it is for the guys. Think about it as for the coaches. But by and large, the players. Nobody wears it more than they do. They're, they're the guys out there, when they, when they make a mistake, they know they're letting you down. These guys love you. They love you. They love these fans. They love Mississippi State. And so – uh, my hope is we can have something to smile about here in the next couple of days. I'm not optimistic. Tennessee is a machine, and you know we're, we're kind of limping to the finish. They're trending towards the number one seed in the tournament, but they're not 25 runs better than us. And, that, and that, again, last night was an absolute embarrassment. It absolutely was. There's no other way to describe it. It seems like forever ago I wrote a book about a college World Series champion called uh, Mississippi State, a book called Dogpile. You can find it at dogpiletobook.com. Father's Day is coming up, and you're probably wondering what to get your Mississippi State father. And maybe you didn't get a, your mom a great Mother's Day gift. Maybe you got her, like, some gloves or something to work in the yard. That's a terrible gift. Get her a personalized copy of Dogpile or Alpha Dog, Stark Villains, Flim Flam. Maybe mom would like a copy of Bloomsville Leander. You can get that through Amazon.com. BarnesandNoble.com, BooksMillion.com. But I would be remiss if I did not mention Frank Carolla today. I got a message this morning that Frank Carolla passed away. Frank out of Leland, Mississippi. Pretty quick story here. I was at a basketball game. My agent comes up to me and says, hey, it's a guy here with a great story about his uncle. I got Frank Carolla's number from his nephew. I called him. And uh, he was in Stark Villains. It's a chapter called the Delta Maroon Barons about uh, before the 1946 Egg Bowl. That Frank Carolla and Skeeter Edwards flew a J-3 Cub airplane from Leland, Mississippi to Oxford, and they poured marine paint in the bleachers and then spread white toilet paper all over Fraternity Row. And they effectively painted the Ole Miss campus maroon white. And they made a pact and never tell their story. And after Skeeter died, Frank said he felt like he'd held up his end of the deal. And now Frank and Skeeter... They're in heaven together, I believe. And now they can uh, reminisce about their time together. They were best friends. And um, I'm so glad and so grateful that I had the opportunity to document that story for, for future Bulldog generations, all the way back from 1946, a story nearly 80 years old. We have it documented in Stark Villains. And Frank is even blurred on the back of the book. And you, know, you got Ron Polk and Bob Tyler get Jackie Sherrill. And the final blurb on the back of Stark Bellwins is Frank Carolla. And Frank says, I just didn't like Ole Miss. I don't know how else I can explain on that or expound on that. I just didn't like him. I thought, what better way to finish our show today? Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we'll make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. 
Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply.